Welcome, everybody. We'll call to order the Legislative Commission on Cybersecurity. Today is Tuesday, June 27th. It's uh, 10.06. So welcome, everyone. Um, this is, I think, our officially our second meeting. And so we're going to go through. The agenda has been published for everyone. We will have a, an update from the uh, um, from Minute and Commissioner Tomes. And then we'll also later go into a closed session um, immediately following a regular session. So members, you have the location in your packet. And uh, so we'll get, we'll get rolling. We have a new, um, a new session. And we've, it's now time to elect new leadership. And so we have uh, the three positions to elect. We've got the chair, vice chair, and the secretary. And so, uh, oh, and so before we get there, that's, that's going to be the agenda. And then so um, a quorum is present. And then um, our first order of business is approval of the uh, June 14th, 2022 min minutes. I would entertain a motion to accept the minutes. I would be happy to, inter uh, to approve the minutes for Tuesday, June uh, 27th, 2023. Oh, sorry, wrong one. June 14th, 2022. My Excellent. apologies. Representative, Representative Bonner makes a motion. Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? Minutes are approved. All right, so what we'd like to do is, uh, it's a new session. Let's go through and, and do an introduction for members, for the, for the public, and then the staff um, f that we have present. So um, I'll go first. I'm State Senator Mark Cran, represent Senate District 28 now. Uh, most all of Chisago counties and Isana counties, and hard to believe this is my seventh year at the legislature. It feels like yesterday. Um, so welcome everybody, and so let's just move to the left, and then we'll come back around. Sure. Uh, I am State Representative uh, Kristen Bonner of Maple Grove, and I serve as the Vice Chair on the Legislative Commission on Cybersecurity. Um, I represent all of me almost all of Maple Grove at this time, and have about 20 plus years IT experience. I'm State Representative Jim Nash, representing District 48A. This is my ninth year in the legislature. Uh, I work in cybersecurity and have worked in IT for the last 18, 19 years as well. Um, happy to be here. Uh, State Representative uh, Steve Elkins, um, House District 50B, which is uh, the western half of Bloomington, basically, and uh, I've worked in information management for the last 25 years of my private sector career. Eric Lucero, State Senator from the Elberville, St. Michael, Elk River area. I've been in the legislature for nine years, first year in the Senate, and I have been a, a technologist within the cybersecurity field for over 20 years. And I'm Melissa Wickland. I'm state senator representing District 51, and I, it's about half of Bloomington, all of Richfield, and part of a little bit of Minneapolis. Um, I've been in the legislature since 2013, and I have a background in IT. I have, I'm not currently working in the field, but I have a degree in electrical engineering and worked in telecommunications and data networking um, for quite a few years, and I'm glad to be part of this committee. Excellent. Thank you, everybody. And so we have to my left, Michelle Weber. Good morning, everyone. I'm Michelle Weber. I'm the Executive Director of the Legislative Coordinating Commission, and we provide administrative support to the commission. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ms. Weber. And Senator Zhang, we're, we're just doing introductions, so welcome. Hello. Um, I'm Senator Tu Zhang, one of the newly appointed members. Or at least that, that was what I was told. <laughs> Excellent. And newly elected this yeah, year and newly you. appointed cybersecurity. Yeah, thank you, so. Senator Kern. Welcome aboard. And so we have uh, additional staff. Good morning. My name is Mina, and I am the Commission Administrative, as Administrative Assistant with the LCC, working with Michelle. So I'll be here to provide admin support to this commission and other commissions that the LCC is working with. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. And welcome. And so with that, members, we have an uh, opportunity. Well, now let's move on to the uh, um, election of the chair for the uh, chair for the for the um, legislative audit committee, or I'm not legislative for the cybersecurity. Um, so would entertain um, nominations for the chair. Sure, 
to the house. It does. Representative Bonner has been nominated. Any other nominations? See no other nominations? Call roll call for the, to elect uh, Representative Bonner as the, as the chair for the, for the Cybersecurity Commission. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion carries. Congratulations. The vice chair, now to the chair, and uh, we'll turn over the gavel. So, thank you, everybody. I enjoyed serving our first meeting and look forward to many years. Thank you. Um, I will ask this question and, and just sort of open this for a brief discussion. I know we need to uh, select a vice chair. Um, I do know that we have one brand new member and one yet unappointed member. So uh, do we feel like we want to go ahead and nominate a vice chair today, or do we want to hold off until our next meeting when we have all of our members seated? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I, given that we have, um, I think we've been both bicameral and bipartisan, um, sort of by practice, so... Yep. Um, I would nominate Senator Lucero to be vice chair, mm -hmm. as much as it pains me to nominate senators for, you know, <laughs> things. No, uh, I, would I, I would nominate Senator Lucero, uh, given that we have had bipartisan and bicameral swipping, uh, swapping. Fair enough. All right. Um, we have a nomination for uh, Senator Lucero as vice chair. Do we have any other nominations? Seeing none, uh, we will go ahead to, and go to a vote. Uh, the vote is to nominate uh, Senator Lucero as vice chair for the Legislative Commission on Cybersecurity. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. So moved. Uh, the last piece then is the secretary. Uh, must be a member of the House. It sounds like. Um, so that leaves us two possible nominations at the moment. Um, would we like to nominate someone for secretary? I would nominate Representative Nash if he's interested. Representative Nash? Sure. Yeah. Excellent. All right. Um, we have a nomination for Representative Nash for secretary. Are there any other nominations? All right, seeing none, we'll go straight to a vote. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? It is decided. All right, congratulations. We have finished out our slate there. Um, we are going to go then to, to um, Ms. Weber for a brief overview. Madam Chair and members, included in your packets today is an outline of the legislative changes that were adopted this last session related to the Cybersecurity Commission. Many of these changes were reviewed by the commission previously and informed the closed meeting procedures that the commission adopted. So it outlines in the statute um, the definition of security records. It also um, identifies that the information that is shared during a closed meeting must be kept um, secure and private for at least eight years and no more than 20 years. One of the concerns that was raised previously with the initially enacted legislation was that information after eight years might still pose a risk to the cybersecurity of the state. And so that was why the um, additional time frame was identified. It also under, it added a subdivision 5A that speaks to the closed meeting procedures, which aligns um, pretty closely with the procedures that have been adopted by the commission, which are the procedures that you will um, operate under today because today's meeting's happening on June 27th. The new law doesn't go into effect until July 1st. Um, but one of the items that I'd like to point out about the procedures that was requested by organizations um, that um, are, are very interested in transparency of government information was that during a closed meeting, a vote cannot be taken by the commission. So the commission cannot take formal action during a closed meeting. 
And with that, I am happy to answer any questions that you might have. Madam Chair. Yes, uh, and, Senator and Ms. Weber, I think the clarification to the 20 years at the, the maximum, um, even at that point, that could you cover the review that would ensure that that data still wouldn't disclose any um, confidential information that would still pose security risks? Is that correct? Uh, Madam Chair and Senator Curran, one of the provisions under subdivision 5A is item five that does instruct the commission, so I think this would be future work that the commission would, would take on, that the, the commission will develop guidance for the Legislative Coordinating Commission regarding the public release of security records following the eight-year period. And so we would be looking for guidance from this commission to be developed that would inform what review would take place. Thank you. Thank you for that introduction. Um, and then, uh, do we have any questions or discussion around those items or the changes from uh, the previous session? And obviously, we will need to take note that there is an action item uh, for us to continue to work on guidance uh, for how we are handling those records after the eight-year period among this group um, as a future item. Um, any other discussion, questions, concerns? Representative Nash. Thank you, Madam Chair. If Ms. Weber could cover subdivision 5B, uh, there are some stipulations in there that might uh, warrant clarification for folks here in the audience or those watching online. Sure. Yes. <laughs> Ms. Weber. Madam Chair and Representative Nash, Fi Subdivision 5B provides an outline <laughs> of a uh, circumstance in which a member of the commission um, has, has received um, an allegation that they have violated the confidentiality requirements of the closed session. And so in, in that type of circumstance, the allegation would be brought before the ethics committees in both the House and the Senate for review. And the member would be prohibited from participating in closed sessions until those ethic committees have determined that there was not a violation of the confidentiality. Thank you, Ms. Weber, and thank you for that. I was thinking along much the same long, uh, lines. Um, just to remind members to please read through that section and make sure that we are aware of our responsibilities. That would be helpful. Um, any further discussion before we move on to the next item? If not, uh, we do have a minute here uh, to present a public presentation first before we go into the closed meeting uh, to just give sort of an overview uh, for us before we head down that path. I believe we have Commissioner Tomes and um, our CISO, uh, John Israel, here for that presentation. And with that, I will turn it over to you, Commissioner. Thank you, Chair Bonner. Good morning. Uh, for the record, my name is Tarek Tomes, and I am the Commissioner of Minnesota IT Services and Chief Information Officer for the State of Minnesota. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to uh, testify today and uh, provide perspectives on the current cybersecurity threats uh, and incidents and, and the evolving nature uh, of this. Uh, just want to really uh, share or express a thank you for this committee and, and, and just the work that this committee does and, and the important role that this committee uh, will continue to play in, in helping to protect Minnesota uh, from cybersecurity uh, uh, impacts. When, when we last met, we talked uh, and, and we shared information just related to the geopolitical threats that exist worldwide and, and how they manifest themselves uh, from a cybersecurity perspective. And those certainly still exist and will continue to evolve uh, and, and, and new threats evolve. And, and as such, that threat landscape, if you will, will continue to change and, and will continue to evolve. And it's just unbelievably important and crucial that we continue to evolve and uh, change the way we do things and, and continue to learn from from others, uh, from incidents that we see occurring both globally, uh, domestically, within the state of Minnesota, the, the, the threat sharing element is unbelievably crucial for all 
organizations and entities to almost envision themselves in the shoes of someone that has faced a cyber incident and, and how that particular cyber incident may impact their organization and continue to evolve how they do work and, and the types of defenses uh, that they have in place. And we strive to do that uh, with, with each incident that we see to continue to think about you know, what would that mean for the state of Minnesota and what does that mean related to our defensive capabilities and the layers of defense that we have in place. I'm going to touch real briefly on our strategic planning uh, work, uh, and then uh, I'll turn it over to John Israel, our chief information security officer, to uh, provide a little bit more detail on the, the current threat landscape. Uh, over the last six months, we've spent a lot of time evolving and, and uh, creating our updated strategic plan. We previously shared a strategic plan that was created, I think, in 2019 to coincide with the governor's first term. And, and that strategic plan over the last six months has been updated. Uh, we have engaged with what we refer to a lot of listening posts. Uh, we've engaged with stakeholders, with the Technology Advisory Committee, uh, with our business partners, with, with a lot of different groups to, to shape how Minute's strategic plan going forward aligns with the governor's one Minnesota plan and certainly aligns with the threat landscape that we see. And, and we're uh, excited to share that updated strategic plan in the next probably three to four weeks. And, and really, it will serve as our, our North Star uh, collectively and collaboratively related to how we will continue to, to change and evolve one of the things that uh, we're really excited about uh, as it relates to our the strategic plan is just how we'll help us design tomorrow's government today. And, and tomorrow's government certainly will be a government that continues to be more and more digital, that will have more digital service opportunities for Minnesotans, that will have more self-service capabilities for Minnesotans. And with a continued build out of digital service opportunities, those certainly manifest themselves as opportunities for cyber criminals and, and the threats that uh, exist there. And as we rely on these digital capabilities, and we've seen these impacts worldwide, hospitals shut down at times just uh, because of uh, different cyber threats that they're facing, we will continue to stay vigilant on that front. We'll continue to modernize and transform the services and, and products uh, at scale. And, and to really evolve the best that we see in the industry, in particular in, in cloud-based services uh, and in layers of protection, to, to change how we do our work, uh, to fundamentally significantly change how we are ready to provide a future-ready government from a digital uh, perspective. To position us a little bit better uh, to deliver on that particular objective, Perhaps one of the most important things that we'll certainly do over the next 24 to 36 months is to most effectively and most efficiently uh, leverage the investment that the legislator, legislature provided in this past year's legislative session. It is an un unbelievable opportunity for state government, a significant investment in, and, and I'd like to call out three you know, broad areas that were, I think we're gonna see not just impact within the executive branch of government, but we'll see impact throughout the state. A significant investment in cybersecurity protections, uh, both uh, statewide and in supporting the whole of state uh, approach and leveraging federal infrastructure money to improve layers of defenses for organizations that are completely under-resourced, really small, that are starting from a very different place, and even uh, slightly larger local forms of government uh, that uh, simply can't at times afford the types of services that are necessary to protect constituent services. Uh, a, a significant investment in, in cloud and our opportunity to move and continue to evolve uh, and modernize services and, and leverage cloud constructs uh, from all layers kind of, of the cloud topology that also will include opportunities to recover and respond in a much faster and resilient manner, but also has layers of protection in front of that and, and puts us into 
a community and an ecosystem of uh, really large scale uh, players that face these kinds of threats on a day in and day out basis and, and, and our ability to, to leverage and continue to tap into that larger ecosystem of uh, private sector organizations uh, that really provide uh, so much important help. And then last but not least, a significant investment in modernizing our application portfolio, an opportunity to really think about where that intersection of customer service, risk reduction, and uh, helping government perform more efficiently where that intersection exists. And I think that targeted app modernization will considerably lower the risk profile of state government uh, in that it will allow us to replatform uh, applications that currently have significant cyber threats where maybe the patching isn't possible because of the underlying infrastructure uh, that is in place there. And so those investments, those three investments in particular, I think are going to be uh, unbelievably uh, crucial to continuing to mature how the state uh, does their work. Really want to thank this body for their vision and support and providing uh, those significant investments and, and look forward to continuing to partner and work uh, with this body and, and, and appreciate your leadership, uh, not just within this body, but really across the legislature as a whole in, in providing that crucial education related to technology and more specifically uh, cyber uh, threats that we face. With that, I'd like to turn it over to John. Madam Chair, members, my name is, for the record, my name is John Israel. I'm the uh, Chief Information Security Officer for the state working for MINUT. Uh, as uh, we've worked together in the past, and I'll, I'll echo many of the commissioner's uh, comments that I've appreciated the time and the opportunity to work with you in the past in the meeting that, that we held last year, as well as in the, the interim since that time. Uh, as I, I can share a little bit about just kind of the global threat landscape, because as commissioner indicated that the, the threat continues to evolve and grow throughout, uh, throughout our nation and throughout the, throughout the world, uh, through, uh, specifically when it comes to cyber risks. Just looking at the recent uh, Verizon data breach report, you can see the number of metrics that were, that were tracked by, uh, in this, this very public report, tracking over 16,000 cyber incidents uh, and over five, uh, nearly 5,200 confirmed breaches from last year that were analyzed. And kind of looking at the, the, the growing threat that, this, that these lead to, including just the increase in cost of ransomware incidents. 95% of those ransomware incidents are now costing well over a million dollars in order to, to investigate and respond. Uh, most of these threats we continue to see are financially motivated. And as we dig into more of the metrics, we'll find that just kind of some of the commonalities that we see. I think many of these are probably not surprises to you. The vast majority of incidents are human facing and human caused things, whether that is uh, compromising credentials, tricking people to, to give up their, their accounts and their passwords uh, through phishing attacks and other means. But a growing number of those events is also related to vulnerabilities uh, and, and exploiting vulnerabilities in software uh, applications in this very interconnected world where we are very dependent more and more uh, on vendors and software solutions that we, that we, that we buy and, and maintain. Uh, Throughout the uh, throughout the entire industry, uh, state government is not immune to these. It is this is a this is a. This is uh, software supply chain is a concern and, and kind of a direction that uh, we're tracking through all of uh, cyber in industry. Uh, the kind of uh, highlight a few of the kind of recent uh, kind of events that we've seen just in the last year. There's been a number of major breaches that have hit national news. Uh, T-Mobile themselves were targeted uh, multiple times with uh, with cyber attacks that went after through uh, web API. Uh, the application programming in interface kind of attacks, kind of diving in and trying to get in where they, they had uh, nearly 37 million accounts that were compromised uh, multiple times over the last year. And on the DDoS side, we've, we've tracked a number of events with Cloudflare. Cloudflare recently is a, is a, a vendor that defends uh, companies against the distributed denial of service attacks. And they recently defended against the largest DDoS attack ever, uh, well over two terabytes in, in activity. Uh, this, is, this is very common that we're seeing that these attacks continue to grow, continue to ele elevate, and continue to target systems uh, and uh, impact, potentially impact websites and, and impact services. Uh, another large global one that you're likely aware of that we've been tracking here is uh, is with a software program called Move It. A company called Progress Software uh, released a, a file transfer soft program application called Move It. Uh, to date, we've tracked nearly 3,000 organizations that were running vulnerable versions of this software. Uh, this was a, a zero-day attack. 
Uh, that's that I think we've gone, I know we've tracked in the hundreds of organizations that have, that have had data impact from this particular incident and this exploit. And, uh, and we're learning about more and more of those every day, some of them large scale, uh, including uh, organizations like the, the, the California Public Employee Retirement System that had nearly 760,000 accounts that were, uh, that were compromised and data that was compromised just in a recent incident. That was re result of a vendor that they used called PBI. PBI has a lot of customers and nearly just that one server, uh, one set of server inf infrastructure that was compromised had nearly 4.7 million records uh, that were compromised, including names, social security numbers, uh, dates of birth, zip codes, addresses, and a lot of more information. Uh, ultimately, what this particular vulnerability results from is, is what we call a zero day vulnerability. And I got a little bit of a graphic here to help understand because uh, it's a... It, with a zero-day vulnerability, what, what really occurs there is an attacker, a, a threat group, finds a way to break into a piece of software. They find a flaw, they find a bug, they find a hole, and then they keep that secret and hold on to it. They work and craft their way to how we're going to make use of this, and then they launch that exploit, get as much information as they can, and then that's the first time that we get to see about it. We don't know about that, that vulnerability until then. The vendor finds out, and really the, we, we call it a, a zero day because they find out they've had zero days to fix that vulnerability before it's been exploited. And that's exactly what happened in this move in situation uh, incident. Uh, obviously, as you're likely aware, uh, Minnesota was not immune for this attack. We did uh, have, have impact. We had, we had uh, instances of move it, and we completed an investigation analysis uh, on that, and that information was shared publicly previously. That's what I have for you, Madam Chair. Be glad to cover more in, a, in the closed session. Thank you for that, uh, Commissioner, and uh, to our CISO, John Israel. Is there any, uh, before we move to the closed door portion of the meeting, are there any questions or discussion for the public that we'd like to discuss? Representative Nash. Thank you, Madam Chair. And just wanted to set for the public, uh, before we enter into closed session, that um, these types of occurrences, and Senator Lucero can corroborate this since we both work in, th this is not typically as a result of, of uh, malfeasance or bad behavior or laziness or any of These things just happen. Um, when you build and design software, um, things, things are eventually made known to bad actors and that bad actors exist around the world Quite literally, some of them are uh, companies in other countries that they wake up every day and they go and clock in with the specific job of hacking. That's the job. And before we enter into closed session, Madam Chair, I just wanted to put that on record as to saying that this is not something that, that people should be banging their shoe on the table to demand answers of minute. But these things happen. You deal with them professionally. You try to move on as best you can. You shrink your footprint once again. You, you fix what you know, and then you prepare for what happens next because this is this never ends. Um, it is a very profitable enterprise for the people who do this, and it is not something that we are ever going to get out from underneath. So no amount of spending will get us to where we're immune. It, it just doesn't work that way. But I, I wanted to make sure to put that out there before we enter into closed session so that people watching from home or that will watch us eventually later on, uh, that, that this is this is... Uh, what happens? I mean, the cybersecurity industry representative, or Representative Lucero, former Representative Lucero, now Senator. Um, I mean, we deal with this on a daily basis. It's a, it's billions and billions and billions of dollars that are spent on cybersecurity every year. Um, it's not going away. So I just wanted to make sure we got that on the record, so that that before you know, as we enter into the closed session, that people aren't left wondering, well, you know, who screwed up. So. Yes, thank you, uh, Representative Elkins. <clears throat> Yeah, just to add on to that, as we know, the uh, the human factor is always the weak link, and uh, uh, I remember that my in my last years at uh, at Optum Technology, uh, the company took to uh, actually generating internal kind of uh, quasi phishing messages, and uh, if uh, an employee clicked on on the link, <clears throat> uh, what it did is it restricted their email privileges until they retook the cybersecurity training class and were, were, were certified to, uh, you know, continue. So 
at, at some companies you're, you're getting to that point of uh, you know focusing that much on the on the human factors. Okay, thank you. Um, any other discussion on that? If not, I do want to have a question for our uh, testifiers today. Um, we did speak sort of on a high level on sort of the landscape generally. Um, and particularly part of the reason we're here today is to talk about the um, Move It file transfer vulnerability and specifically um, for the public to have a sense of transparency why we're here talking about that today. Um, it isn't just uh, out there in a vacuum, um, but we do know that there was some impact to the state. Um, I know there has been a public alert uh, that is available out there to the public to kind of see what happened. But um, could you briefly, um, uh, Mr. Israel, kind of cover just sort of the state's impact um, and, and why we're here today uh, before we go into the closed meeting? And then I'll make a few more remarks before we do that. Yes, Madam Chair, I'd be glad to. Uh, so at a, at a very high level, uh, the, this, this particular vulnerability was identified on May 31st. So the, the vendor itself notified us in the afternoon on May 31st. By the time that that had happened, a, that we started an immediate investigation with Minit and, uh, and learned that one of our servers had been compromised prior to that notification. This is that zero day that, uh, that, that alert. The vendor found out and notified their customers after they'd already been exploited. Uh, in the coming days and the weeks, we, we, uh, we were able to complete an investigation and analysis and, and kind of confirm that the, the scope was fairly limited within Minnesota. Uh, we did have uh, three instances of the server. One of them was impacted, two were not. Uh, and that one that was impacted, the, the bad actors were, uh, were in that server for about 15 minutes and were able to access 24 files. Uh, in the scope and scheme of things, uh, it's, that it's never good to have, a, have this kind of event happen and have any kind of data stolen. Um, it's, uh, this, our experience was fairly limited compared to what we've seen in, uh, in entities around the globe and around the world where those bad actors stayed in those servers for hours and hours and hours and, and collected and exfiltrated a lot of information. Um, we, we did have good information and good ability to do this investigation and analysis. We'll talk a little bit more about that in the, some more of the details in the closed session, but we were very confident in, in the assessment and the impact statement that we released uh, related to those very specific files that were, that were accessed, uh, the method that was used to get into that server, uh, and the, the fact that it was this, this zero day vulnerability, uh, which in our coordination with law enforcement and others has been uh, has been tied to a foreign nation uh, tied actor group. All right, uh, thank you for that. And I did want to make note that um, again, there is a publicly available um, reference to this uh, on one of the Minnesota uh, websites uh, to, and I was trying to look for it here and I thought I had it up on my phone um, so that folks can see a little bit more of the detail of that. Um, there was some student information that was exposed, and I believe that the uh, affected parties have all been contacted um, to make sure that they take necessary steps um, and to be alerted that their information may have been compromised. Um, so I appreciate that overview. Um, and with that, um, I also wanted to say um, it is our tent before we move to our closed door meeting. I just want to kind of give transparency to the public. Um, uh, with that, uh, our intent today is to have a little deeper dive discussion on the specifics of that attack um, with MDE to talk about um, the impact to our state and to our systems here on the state level, as well as our uh, risk mitigations and things that are in process uh, to both uh, lower our risk from the current attack, but also um, sort of our proactive pieces going forward to ensure that we are protecting uh, the state's assets um, and our data, of course, for all of our citizens. So with that said, it is now our intent to go into a closed door meeting. Um, in order to make that happen, we do need to take a vote to go into a closed door session. Um, and I think for the record and for transparency, we should probably do a roll call for that. That's all right with Ms. Weber. And I will give it to her to take the roll. Uh, Madam Chair, Representative Bonner. 
Aye. Vice Chair Lucero. Yes. Senator Coran. Yes. Representative Elkins. Yes. Representative Nash. Aye. Senator Wickland. Yes. Senator John. Yes. Madam Chair, there are seven ayes. Thank you. There being seven ayes, we will then proceed to the closed door portion of the meeting. Um, and at this time, anyone who is not to be a part of that session, we would ask them to please leave the room. And Madam Chair, if we could uh, let some time elapse and then close the doors so that uh, people in the ante room. Yeah. Are we leaving? Um, Are we going to do, do it? Mind, Madam Chair? Oh. <laughs> Why don't I turn that over to Ms. Weber? <laughs> Madam Chair and members, included in your packets on the back side of your folder is the location of the closed meeting room, um, which will be a different room other than this room. Okay. All right. Thank you for that. Uh, then we will take a brief uh, recess in order to reconvene in the new location. Um, upon arrival, we will have our secretary do the confidentiality notice, and then we will go ahead and proceed. Thank you.